Hey there internets, I'm Michael and this is Two Can Play That Game. And today we are starting our look at uh, Terra Mystica. And uh, let's get this open. So this is going to be the first video on Terra Mystica. And in this video I'll be showing you how to play Terra Mystica. If you're interested in seeing an example of the game being played, that'll be the next video. And then my final video in this series will, of course, be my review, where you can find out my thoughts on the game and whether or not two can play that game. So, what is Terra Mystica? Well, let's take a look at the box here. Let's get this out of the way. There we go. So, Terra Mystica. Well... Let's see, we got some a ring here with some like symbol on symbols and stuff on it. Um got a dwarf with a shovel. A dwarf with a shovel. That seem two dwarfs with shovels. That seems like a good little clue. And then we've got some lands. Hmm. So I I guess it's about dwarfs digging. Is it dwarfs digging? Yeah, I guess guess so. Well, yes and no. The whole nature of Terra Mystica is a kind of city building game. But in order to build your city, you will need to terraform the surrounding areas. And to do that, you spend gold in order to be able to do various things and workers. So it's very much a resource management in order to build up your city and get points because it's a Euro game, so you will win by having the most victory points. First thing you're going to need to do is get your board out. And the board is single sided. There's just a nice little picture on the back with the various races that are in the game included there. And of course we've got the name. So that's the back side of the board, so obviously that means this is the side of the board you want. So we'll start by laying this out on the table here. So we just want to set this board out face down. Uh, you can see around the edge here we have the typical victory point trackers. And in this top left corner we have just a little reminder of how many victory points you'll get for certain things. And I'll talk about those more later on. And this bit here is going to have some tiles put down and also acts as our round tracker. And then this is our actual board. You can see we've got some rivers here and different segments split by colour. So with the board out, the next thing you're going to want to do is pick your factions. Now there are different colour boards for the different colours of lands and play pieces in the game. And as you can see, there are seven to choose from. And then each of those boards is double sided so that it's got a different race on each side. But you use the same colour pieces. So the rule book suggests a couple of preset races to use depending on the number of players that you're using. However, you can just pick randomly or even pick, well, that's my favourite race, I want to play that one if you so choose. However, I'm going to start setting up here for a two-player game using the suggested races from the rulebook. So I will need the nomads, which are yellow, and the witches, which are green. So once you've got the player boards, you'll then need to get out the pieces for those colours. So we've got green there and yellow there. The rest of the coloured pieces we'll put back in the box. So once you've got your player pieces, you'll need to get them set out on your boards. So looking at the nomads board here, we'll need to put out these dwellings, which are the house-like ones on this bottom track here. And you always fill from the right and take from the left with these building tracks. And you can see there's a little space of a square for each one. And when you would take one away, you'll be revealing something and that will be some, some income you'll gain during the income phase. So as well as the dwellings, we have these 
trading posts and these will go here and you'll have four of these again you can see they just cover up the spaces available there and then we have the round ones which are the temples that go here then we have the two special buildings so we have this squarish one which is your stronghold and that sits here and then we have your sanctuary which i like to call the lozenge and that sits up here so that's all your buildings set out you then will also have these three sticks, they are your bridges, and you'll just want to sit those to the side of your player board available for later on in the game. You'll also have these little meeples that are your priests, and again, you'll just be sitting those next to your board available for whenever you receive any during the game. Additionally, you'll have seven of these cylinders that are markers. Two of those will go on your player board here, one in this spade area and just goes on the bottom one of this spade that doesn't have a victory point and will have three workers next to it. The next goes in this shipping track here and we'll just go on the leftmost space which will be a zero. One of these markers we want to put on the victory point track and it starts at 20 points which I know a bit unusual but there we go. And then we have here another board which is single sided again and this has tracks for the various elements of magic and you'll have priests going here to improve that and you'll put one of each of these tokens at the zero space on that track. And you can give each player one of these little um, crib sheet things which just explain what you can do as your action each turn. So the next thing we're going to need to do is get our various tokens and pieces ready near the board. So we have here, we've got our money tokens. You'll need your workers out, which are the little wooden unpainted cubes. So to finish setting up each player you'll need to look at the top of the player boards here to see what starting resources they get. So for the witches here they will start with two on the air track so we just move them up to the two position on this air track. They also start with 15 money and free workers. So that is their starting resources set out. Now we need to do the same for the nomads. They only get two workers, but they still get 15 money. And they get one fire track and one earth track. So I will simply Move that one up and that one up. The next thing is to fill up the player's bowls of power. So you'll need to give each player 12 of these purple tokens. And the rest you can put back in the box because you'll never need more than that. And then how you distribute those tokens on these bowls of power here, which is these purple section in the top left is denoted by the numbers on the one bowl and two bowl. So for both of the witches and the nomads, we put seven in the two bowl and five in the one bowl. So that's the player boards all set up. We now need to finish setting up the main board. So we're gonna need some of these cross tokens put near each of these scrolls at the bottom along the board and these are so that you can mark when these have been used each round. 
as each one can only be used once in a round. Next, you're gonna to wanna to place the scoring tiles in the one to six spaces. So in a normal game, we would just shuffle these up randomly and then deal them out to each place. And on the sixth place, we would cover the end of round bonus with the end game token. As we're doing the preset, we have to follow the little picture here for which ones we have set out. So if you have space, you're also gonna to want to lay out your favor tiles. Those are these oval ones. So the ones that give you one spot on a cult track, um, there are three of, I think, and the same for the ones that give you two spots on a cult track. And then there's one of each cult track that gives you three spaces on that cult track, and there's only one of each of those. So we'll also need the town tiles near the board available for when people create towns. And we'll need the terraforming tokens, which when you do dig to terraform a location, you can use these tokens to change the color of a location by putting the token down. So the final thing to set out is these bonus cards. Now these have pictures of closed scrolls on one side and open scrolls on the other and the number of these you'll be using will vary depending on the number of players you're using and the number is number of players plus three. So for a two-player game we would put out five of these tiles for a five-player game eight. If you're using the suggested setup from the rule book that will specify which bonus cards to use. So I'm just gonna set out the suggested ones for a two player game. Decide who your first player is, which according to the rules would be the person who last did some digging in their garden. However, as you know, I much prefer to randomize it. So the easy way to randomize, I find for this, but you can do it any way you want, is I just close my eyes, shake these up and drop one out. So there we go. Witches would be going first. Give your starting player the starting player marker. The next thing you want to do is put out your starting dwellings. Now, if you're using the preset example as we're doing for this setup, then you will follow the picture as given in the book and just put your color of dwellings where it says to. But if I was choosing now, the which the green player as first player would get to place a dwelling and they'd have to place it on one of the green spaces. So it's important to note the watery ones with a bit of green on, they are actually blue spaces, not green. The other colors are pretty clear. So these foresty spaces are the green spaces and the witch would get to place one dwelling out, which of course would mean they would then increase their income. Next, the next player going in clockwise order would get to place one of their dwellings on a place of their color. Once all players have placed their first dwelling, you'll then have the person in last place, so the person who just placed a dwelling, in this case, the yellow player nomads, place a second dwelling. And then you go counterclockwise until you get back to your first player who will again get to place a dwelling, at which point you are done putting out your starting buildings. So with the game all set up, your table should look something like this. You'll have your cult track here, each of your player boards, which should look like this. You'll have the board set out like this. So you'll have your scoring tiles set out like so. You'll have your dwellings out on the locations ready on the board, keeping in mind that the nomads have an extra dwelling out because that is their special ability. And special abilities are given on the book that's on the bottom right of the player boards for the various races. So as I say, the nomads, they get an extra dwelling, which is put out after all the other dwellings and the witches get extra five victory points every time they found a town. You'll have your bonus cards set out, as well as your workers and coins, and you will also have your favor tiles set out. To kick the game off, 
is we need to choose our first round bonus cards. So to do this, you'll start with the last player, which in the game we're setting up here was the yellow player. And so the yellow player will pick which one of these bonus tiles they want. Now, these bonus tiles will give you various potential abilities or bonuses throughout that round. For instance, some will have the hand out symbol that indicates you'll get income during that round. Also, there's this one here, which will allow you to do a free dig action. Others, such as this one here, will give you victory point in the same way that the score tiles do. So there are various benefits you can take and the player will just pick one and that will go in front of them and they'll have the benefit of that for that round. Then you go around in reverse play order, so anti-clockwise. So we'd be moving on to now our first player and they're gonna take this one here. Once each player has taken their bonus tiles, you'll then put a coin on each of those that's left. Then we move on to the rounds of play. As I've already said, the game is made up by six rounds, which are tracked by the scoring tiles over here. And in that round, there are a few phases. The first phase is the income phase. So each player will look at their player board and any bonus tiles or favor tiles or anything that they have in front of them to see what income they will get. And as I've already said, the income is denoted by the hand symbol. So for the start of the game, we can look at the witches here player board. We can see that they will get one, two, three workers and there's nothing else on their player board that they would get as income. However, they are also getting two workers from the tile that they took. And then for the nomads here, we would be getting four workers plus two coins. And that would be the income phase complete. So while we're talking about income, let's just talk about how power works. So some of the incomes you can see have a purple disc with a number on. That would mean you would gain power. So for example, here it would be gain two power. So with power, you have these three bowls. Whenever you gain power, if you have any power in bowl one, you would move it from bowl one to bowl two. So in this instance, gaining two would put two there. If we then gained three more power, those three would move up. So let's say we had all of the power in bowl two here and we were doing our income phase. So we gained two power. We would then be able to move them from bowl two to bowl three. So whenever bowl one is empty, you are then able to move from bowl two to bowl three. However, if we had even one in bowl one, even though we have some in bowl three, whenever we gained any, we'd have to move from bowl one to bowl two first. Also, you can move power from bowl two to bowl three by permanently removing one power from your game board. And you will never get that back throughout the rest of the game. But for each one you remove, you're able to move one power from bowl two into bowl three. You are only ever able to spend power when it is in bowl three. If you do not have any power in bowl three, you cannot spend any. Power can be spent in a couple of ways. You can either spend it on the power actions that are listed on the board, or you can spend it for the actions that are listed on your player sheet. So you can spend five power to get a priest, for example, or you could spend three to get a worker or one to get a gold. You can do these conversions of power to 
items listed on your sheet at any point. It does not take one of your actions. Also, at any point, you can do the converting of a priest to a worker and a worker to a gold. If you're in a situation where all your power is in bowl three and you gain power, you would not be able to move any as you have nothing in bowl one or two. If you have a situation where you have power in bowls one and two and three, you are able to spend the power that you have in bowl three despite having power in bowls one and two. The only limitation is obviously when you gain power, it will always move first from bowl one to bowl two, then bowl two to bowl three. Next would come our actions phase. Now, the actions phase works that each player will perform a single action of the available actions, and I'll explain what they are in a moment and then play proceeds clockwise. So our first player would be the witches here. So they would perform one action, at which point it would then pass to the nomads who would perform one action, then back to the witches, back to the nomads. So because you're just performing one action, it will pass around very quickly. The actions phase will end once each player has chosen to pass, which is one of the available actions. So who, when you choose to pass, you will give in your bonus tile and you'll put it face down to indicate that you have given it in and you will then pick a new bonus tile of those available face up for you to use in the coming round. Once you have passed in this way you won't be able to do any more actions during this round however other players are free to continue doing actions for as long as they want. So in a two player game, you can have one person passing very early on and the other person playing for quite a while afterwards. It's important to note that the first person to pass will also get the first player token for the following round. So once all players have passed, that will then be the end of the actions phase and you'll move on to the third phase of the round. Now this is your cult bonuses and cleanup. So the cult bonuses are dictated by your scoring tile for the round. And the way this will work is it will give a number of cult points and then what you get for that. So if you have, for this bottom one here, four fire cult points, you would get four power. If you had eight, you'd get eight power. Let's take an easier example, such as this one brown, that is the third one up, which is uh, one on the earth track. So you get a coin for each point you have on the earth track at the end of that round. So then as part of the cleanup, you would need to remove any of these activation tokens off of anything that's been activated, either on the main board, on your own player boards, or potentially on any cards that you have in front of you. Then you would put a coin on the free bonus tiles that were not taken when people passed. And finally, you will flip over the scoring tile for that round to indicate that that round is now finished. And that's how you'll be tracking the rounds on which round you are on. And that is then the cleanup finish. So you would then move on to the next round, starting once again with your income phase. So let's talk now about the actions you can perform in your action phase. There are eight options as denoted on the little player aid that there is for each player. The first of these actions is to terraform a space. Now, how you terraform a space is by spending spades. And you can get these spades by spending workers per your player board track here of spades or potentially from bonus tiles or from the power scrolls at the bottom here. Once you've determined how many spades you are getting, you would then transform that space. 
Now you can transform it only a single space, even if that would not get you to where you need it to be to build. So let's talk about this red space here and it's the witch's turn and they want to terraform this. Well, the first thing is with the terraforming, they have a couple of options because for them, the red is two spades away from their color. And you can tell this by the wheel that is shown on each player board. And it does vary for each player how many spades it takes to get to their color. So the way you, you determine how many spades you would need is you start with your color and then count the number of spades to reach the other colors. So it's going to be between one and three spades always. Now you don't need to spend the full number of spades to get to your color. You could, let's say we're doing this red here, which would cost two spades for green to turn it green, but they could spend a single spade to get the red to be gray. So that next turn, they could then terraform again and make it green. However, in between, this yellow player would have a chance to spend resources to terraform that space and reverse what was being done. But let's say we went for a nice easy one here where it's blue next to this green. That would mean that it would only cost one spade, which the green player can get by spending three workers and then terraforms that space from blue to green. With the space now being green, as part of that terraform action, the green player may immediately build a dwelling there by paying the cost denoted on the player board, which is on the very left of the column of that building. So in this case, it would be one gold, sorry, two gold and one worker. And the green player would then place a structure. It's important to note that with both terraforming and with building structures that you may get bonus victory points as depicted on the scoring tiles and potentially on bonus tiles that you have in front of you or favor tiles. So let's talk about this first round here. The green player gets two points for building a, for building a dwelling. But also whenever a player builds next to one of your structures, you have the opportunity to gain power. The amount of power that you can gain is dependent on the level of structures you have that are next to it. So let's talk about a situation where the green player was building there and the yellow player had just that, let's say just that one dwelling there. The level of this dwelling is one power as denoted on the right side of the buildings. So you can see your sanctuary and stronghold are worth three, temples and trade houses, two and dwellings one. So here we have a situation where this dwelling is worth one space. So because this green player built next to that one dwelling, the yellow player would be able to gain one power following the usual rules for gaining power as already explained. However, there is a cost to this, but to better explain that cost, let's imagine a situation where this yellow player already controlled this gray space and they had their stronghold on it. So this green player's just built next to this stronghold and this dwelling, which means next to a total level of four, so the yellow player can gain four power. But wait, I just said about a cost. Well, that cost is equal to the number of power you would gain minus one in victory points. So yes, this yellow player could gain four power, but it would cost them three victory points. So it is a give and take, and you need to be very careful about how often you choose to do that. But obviously the situation which we had, where there was just a single dwelling, that means they could gain that one power without paying anything because one minus one is zero. It's a bit of maths for you. So you can only build structures next to existing structures. 
So I couldn't have built over here, for example, I could only act next to where I had structures already. Now, there are ways to affect what is classed as adjacent in this game, because you can see here there are rivers, and obviously those rivers will stop you being adjacent. However, you can become adjacent by placing bridges which are your little stick symbols. And you can see the starts and ends of bridges on the map. And you'll be able to build a bridge that will then count as adjacency. So for this yellow player, let's say they built a bridge across here from this structure, from this part of the map to this part of the map. This red square would now count as adjacent for the purpose of them terraforming. And that is directly adjacent. There is also indirectly adjacent. And the way you can gain indirect adjacency is with sailing. And your sailing is given on your player board here. And when you increase your sailing, you get victory points for doing so. But there is a cost to increasing it. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But out of sailing you have, indicates the number of spaces of water that you can pass across in order to count as being adjacent. So you start on zero, but once you get to one, that would mean I wouldn't need a bridge to count as adjacent to these spaces here because they're only one space of water away. Obviously, if I wanted to become adjacent to this space here, I would need two sailing and so on. And that leads nicely into our second action, because our second action is to increase your sailing. And the cost to do so is, of course, on the left of that sailing track. So for both the green witches here and the yellow nomads, the cost to increase is a priest, which at the moment neither player has any, and four gold. And that would allow you to immediately increase along that track, gaining the victory points for the space you move to. The next action you can do is to improve your digging. So much like with improving your sailing, you'll pay the cost as denoted. The cost for improving your digging is given on your player board below the digging track. So for both of these players, again, we are looking at two workers, five gold and one priest to do so. But that then reduces the cost of future terraforming. And also you'll gain the number of victory points stated for each point you move up. So we've already talked about building structures. The next action you can do is upgrade those structures. So you will always start building with your dwellings and on your player board, you can see arrows that show you the route of how these structures upgrade. And those arrows are in the color of your player. So for the yellow player, they're yellow. For the green player, they're green. And the way it works is you can upgrade a dwelling into a trade house. And that cost is given on the left of that line of buildings. So for both these players, it would be two workers and either three or six gold. But wait, why either three or six gold? Well, it's cheaper to build a trade house if you're adjacent to an enemy building. So in the situation we have here, the yellow player could choose to upgrade this dwelling to a trade house for two workers and three gold. But if they wanted to upgrade this dwelling down here, which has no enemy buildings adjacent to it, it would cost two workers and six gold. So there are benefits to staying close to your opponents, at the very least for getting your trading houses out there. And there's also benefits from the point of view of when they build, you will gain benefits. And not just when they build, but also when they upgrade. So let's say this yellow player did this upgrade here the dwelling that gets removed gets placed back on the player board, covering up the rightmost space that's been revealed. 
Then, as with when you build a building, you will look at what power of buildings a player has adjacent to it. So, in this situation here, this green player has four power adjacent to it, so they could choose to take four power at the cost of three victory points. Exactly the same as when you're building dwellings. So, dwellings will become trade houses. Trade houses then have two options for what they can become. You can either upgrade them to be a stronghold, which you only have one of, and of course, again, the cost is denoted on your player board for that. Or you can upgrade it to a temple, and you have three of those available on your player board. And of course, when you upgrade your dwelling, you would simply remove the dwelling, put it back on your player board, and put the new building out. Of course, with your temples, the price is again denoted on your player board. Now, with temples, as well as giving you income of priests, whenever you build one, you will also get to pick one of these favour tiles and get to place that in front of you for the rest of the game. Then your temples can be upgraded to a sanctuary. And of course, again, the cost is given there. When you upgrade a building, you remove it and you place the new one there. Now, your sanctuary will give you a special ability. It will allow you to take a favour tile, much as the temple did. But additionally, you will only need to have three spaces in order to build a city rather than four. But I'll talk more about that when I talk about building cities. So, much like with the temples and sanctuaries giving you the favour tiles and special abilities. When you build your sanctuary, that will also give you a special ability that is unique to each race. If you need to find out more details, rather than just relying on the picture, there is at the back of the instruction manual, a list of all the different races and what their starting racial power is, and also what their stronghold power is. So the next option of action is to place a priest on the cult track. So let's say this green witches player had a priest. They could choose to place it on one of the four spaces of each of the cult tracks. So three of the spaces will allow you to move two places on that cult track. And one of the spaces will allow you to move three spaces on the track. So of course, the first person to go there puts their priest on the free points and that priest will then remain on that cult track for the rest of the game. It will never go back to your available pool. However, you would then move one, two, three spaces. Whenever you pass an icon showing a number of power, you would gain that amount of power. If, let's say, I didn't want the green player to lose this priest, but I wanted to use a priest to increase the track, the other option you have is to return the priest to your available pool and move one space up on a cult track. It's important to note with moving up the cult track that the tenth space, only one player can be in each of the tenth spaces. Additionally, you can only move into the tenth space if you have founded a town. And I'll talk about that once I've done going through all the actions. The next option of action is to use these power actions. So you expend the amount of power following the usual rules for power, as I've already gone through, to gain the action denoted there. When you use it, you'll mark it, and that will not be usable by anyone else until the next round. So as well as these power actions down here, you may have special actions of your own given to you by your strongholds, favour tiles, or bonus tiles. These will work in the same way that you'll mark them off with a token to say you've used them, and that counts as your action. And then the final action is, as I've already said, you may pass. And when you pass, you'll put in your bonus tile, taking another one, and if you're the first person to pass, you get to take the first player marker. So with the actions out of the way, I just wanted to talk about founding a town because I've mentioned this a couple of times now, but I've not really said what it is. Well, obviously it's not one of the actions you can do. 
It's actually something that happens automatically when you meet the criteria. So normally you would found a town when you have four directly adjacent structures that have a power value of seven or more. So let's say we're looking at this yellow here and they've built along this line to have four structures adjacent. And they have currently two dwellings and two trading houses. So that would be power of six. And then they upgrade one of these trading houses to a stronghold. That would then mean that they have power seven there and they would immediately form a town. Now, there are a couple of benefits of founding towns. One, as I've already said, you need to have a town founded in order to be able to move up to the 10 space on the cult track. Additionally, there are some scoring tiles that benefit from founding a town. If you're the witches, you get points for founding towns. But also, you get to pick one of these town tokens and they will give you a bonus as depicted on them and, of course, as with everything in this game, the appendices at the end of the rule book will explain what all the different things actually give you in more detail. And you'll take one of those and you'll place it in your town to show that that is a town. There we go, I actually got it to sit on there. And of course, if you have your sanctuary out, that means that those seven points of structures only need to be spread between three structures and not between four as we have here. That's everything about how you play the game. As I say, you'll go through those different turns until you reach the sixth round. Now, at the end of the sixth round, once you've finished your actions phase of that round, you do not then have a cult track bonus or cleanup. Instead, it is then the end game scoring. So obviously you would have been gaining victory points throughout the game and you would have been moving along the track. But at this point, you will then total up any bonuses as denoted by the board here. So the first thing you want to do is work out who has covered the most area. And this only counts if it's adjacent. Now it can be directly or indirectly adjacent, but your structures must be adjacent. Whoever has the most adjacent structures will get 18 victory points, second most 12, third most 6. If you have a draw of who has most and second etc, what you would do is the, if you have two people drawing, you would take the first and second points, add them together and divide by two and both players would get that amount. Then once you've done the area controlled victory points, you would then do your cult track victory points and whoever has the most in each of the cult tracks and you will score each cult track separately so there are four opportunities to have the most of a track the second most etc you will then gain victory points for your position on there again if you're drawing you will add up the positions being drawn drawn for and then divide them equally amongst those people drawing the final thing you'll gain victory points for at the end of the game is your resources in front of you. Now you'll gain one victory point for every three coins in front of you. However, you can trade two coins using the table given on your power bowls section. So for instance, a priest is worth one worker and one worker is worth one coin. And once you've done that, you will then total up the victory points. Whoever has the most is the winner. And there is no tiebreaker. So if there is a tie, then you have a tie. And that is how you play Terra Mystica. I hope that you have found this video useful and helpful in teaching you the game. And I do hope that you will check out the remaining videos in this series and on the channel. And of course, please do share the channel with your friends and family and subscribe to the channel. And also you can find us on social media. We are on Facebook and also on Twitter. And 
as always, thanks for watching and bye for now.